True Consequences is a proud member of the Borellis Podcasters Guild. The Oracle Network. The Oracle Network. Look deeper. True Consequences is a true crime and mystery podcast with stories based in New Mexico and the American Desert Southwest. I'm your host, Eric Carter Von Dean. Hey, Lydia, welcome back to the second half of season three of True Consequences. How are you? I'm doing okay. Thanks so much for having me back, Eric. I appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. But I'm glad you're here with me to tell one of the weirdest cases that has happened in New Mexico. So crazy. Uh, But before we go too far, I want to mention that this episode episode contains themes of domestic violence and murder, which may not be suitable for all audiences, and I definitely advise listener discretion. Also, if you or someone you know is a victim of domestic violence, please call 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 800-799-7233 to reach the National Domestic Violence Hotline. All right. This case is technically a murder case, but unfortunately, the body of the victim has never been found. And it happened about 20 years ago. And if I recall, when I told you that I wanted you to cover this with me, you said that you weren't really that aware of it. Is that right? Yeah, it didn't really sound familiar to me. Okay. But I'm assuming you did some research? Yes. Okay, cool. And so I'm going to be interested to hear your take on some of this insanity Mm -hmm. as we go through it. But a lot of the information that I found uh, researching this case was in the book September Sacrifice by Mark Horner. Um, I spoke with him off the record for several hours. He's an amazing guy. He told me that he was one of the only people that ever interviewed David Parker Ray. So crazy. And he just knew like about he knew about the Hollywood video murders. He remembered uh, the Torreon cabin murders. Like he knew all these things because he covered. He was like an investigative journalist. He worked for Channel Thirteen and Channel Four. Yeah, he he knows his shit. Mm-hmm. And this case for him, he became completely obsessed with it. And before anybody even knew about like all the crazy intricacies of it and before it even made it to the national stage he started collecting all these documents on the case and interviewing people he wrote a book about it and it's probably one of the most thorough investigations into a case that i've ever read mark horner wrote the book jesus did not correct correct mark horner wrote it um it's such a thorough book it's really amazing the information like he even had icq chat transcripts aol Uh, I am chat transcripts. And so all of that information is in the book. He talked to anybody that had any connection to these people. And I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I'm putting a link to the book in my show notes. So uh, support Mark, support local journalism. He's now independent doing his own thing. But uh, definitely recommend that book. And he's still called on to this day to, um, you know, he's like the holy grail of the the information compiled about this case. Yeah. So I would imagine he's still called on very frequently when it comes up. He is. And he said that he used to be like a computer, like his recall of everything, all the, the facts of the case was just instant. And he said that now that he's been kind of removed from it, it it's not as much. And so he's, you know, but he still knows a lot. He's just being humble. (laughs) Um, And then the rest of the uh, references that I used for research are going to be in the show notes as usual. On the morning of September 10th, 1999, bank employees at the Bank of America in Uptown Albuquerque were worried. They were worried because one of their coworkers was late. Now, that seems like a small thing for most people, but that was raising major flags for the coworkers because this coworker was never late. She never missed a day of work. She was always on time and always super professional. And she was even known as the best employee at the bank. She had been rewarded, right, with Mm -hmm. like trips to California and Hawaii just because she was such an exemplary uh, employee. Yep. Yep. She was very well taken care of and well loved. Uh, She was meticulous about everything that she did from her makeup to her hair to the outfits that she was wearing to her job. In fact, one of her supervisors complained about her because she com- she asked so many questions in the initial training that she was getting annoyed. But then she never had to ask any questions ever again after that because she remembered everything and she was on top of it. So um, let's see here. In his book, September Sacrifice, Mark Horner learned that Gurley was loved by everyone who worked with her. She took the time to learn every detail of her job, like I said, by asking tons of questions And she was definitely one of the most efficient people at her branch. The anxiety that the employees felt was made worse by the fact that one of Gurley's friends had been calling the bank all morning long to check in and see if she had made it to work. 
This was not something that ever happened because Gurley was not known to ever receive personal phone calls. So eventually this led to uh, co-workers filing a missing persons report. And the thing that made everyone the most concerned was the fact that Gurley had told all of her co-workers that if she ever went missing or if anything ever happened to her, they should call the police immediately and they should tell the police to look into her ex-husband. She was very vocal about that her ex-husband, that she felt posed a threat to her. Mm-hmm. Yep. She um, was very open about the divorce that she was in, as well as his, his abusive nature. She even hid, because she moved out of his house, she hid where she lived. She only told two people where she lived. Nobody else knew. Hmm. So she was very careful. Here's an excerpt from the, an appeal related to this case. Quote, she, Gurley, worked at the Bank of America since 1997 and was considered an exceptional and efficient employee. She was estranged from her husband, Diazen Hassenkoft. She was very friendly and well-liked. Gurley was a permanent resident in the United States and a citizen of Malaysia, where her family still lives. She lived and worked in Albuquerque since 1992. In September 1999, Gurley was 36 years old. She was petite, 5 feet tall, and weighed about 95 pounds. Gurley returned to her apartment after working on September 9, 1999. However, her friends could not reach her later that evening, or the following morning, and she did not show up to work on September 10th. When Gurley failed to appear at work, police were contacted and a lengthy investigation ensued. All right. So the divorce that she was going through was extremely brutal and bitter. Um, It had been ongoing and vicious, and she was requesting that the court give her half of the assets that they had in the marriage, as well as custody of their adopted child. Quote, unquote, adopted child. Okay. His name was Dimitri. Um, this caused her ex-husband to lash out at her, and started. he started threatening her with violence and even death. It's important to note that at the heart of this case, when you look past all the sensational headlines and the outrageous claims, the very core of this case is a domestic violence case. Absolutely. Right? So I just want my listeners to remember that, um, because there are some crazy things that get said here, but at the end of the day, what, what is most important about this is that Gurley was a domestic violence victim who died at the hands of a brutal narcissistic abuser. Everything else is secondary to that. Um, And domestic violence is sadly commonplace in New Mexico. As the New Mexico Coalition of Domestic Violence noted in a report that describes domestic violence in New Mexico in 2008, 28% of New Mexicans experienced domestic violence, 18% experienced intimate partner violence, and 16% experienced stalking. As for domestic violence, one in three women in New Mexico in 2008 experienced it, and one in seven men. Uh, For intimate partner violence, one in four women and one in 10 men. And then for stalking, one in four women and one in 14 men. So it's a very huge problem here. Yeah, it's definitely a prevalent thing. I think things are kind of changing slowly but surely. But for some reason, everyone that I know that I'm close friends with has either grown up in a home with DV Mm -hmm. or they themselves have experienced intimate partner violence. Right, or they know someone who has. right? Right. Yeah, it's it's a terrible thing, and I don't really know what the answer is to ending it. I don't know that anybody does, but I just wish that they, we could figure it out because it's it's a it's an epidemic. Mm-hmm. So Gurley was a victim of her ex, just as many women in New Mexico and in the U.S. Her husband was even witnessed beating Gurley up by friends and neighbors. He was brutal and remorseless, and when confronted about the violence, he simply claimed that she deserved it. There was even a point in their relationship when an elderly neighbor intervened on her behalf, which gave her enough time to get away from him. Um, And then she eventually moved out. And, you know, thanks to that neighbor. And he was like 70 or 80. So it's scary to think what could have happened to him. But luckily he was okay. She did everything she could to protect herself. She got an order of protection. She spoke with the police. She even reported him to the FBI. Uh, In the end, none of these steps were enough to protect her from him or his violent nature which is why coworkers were so worried when she didn't show up to work on that fateful September morning. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you talk about how, you know, she did everything that you're supposed to do, right? They say, go and tell the police. She told the police many times mm-hmm. and the FBI. Um, she even, uh, what I read was that she even um, joined karate classes yeah. to kind of be able to learn how to protect herself. And she told people around her. And from what 
you know, uh, what you're talking about, like people starting to get concerned. It sounds like she had some sort of safety plan in place. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't hear from me within this time window, now it's time to call the police and let them know. Yeah. There's no way she would have just not showed up at work without calling somebody. Right. You know, she mm -hmm. had so many people around her that loved her and cared about her. I mean, there was a woman that she used to work with when she worked for Bank of Albuquerque that they talked every day, twice a day. And that's the person who kept calling the bank because she was she was used to talking to her all mm -hmm. the time. You know, they were very close. She did everything she could and it still wasn't enough. It's just horrifying. Before we get into the murder and everything that happened with the trial, I want to just kind of go through the main characters in this story. And we'll start with Gurley. So many reporters and true crime shows have labeled her as a mail order bride. Ugh, that's so awful. She was not a oh. mail order bride. Um, and according to Mark Horner's book, it seems that Gurley, um, even though she was born in Malaysia, which is true, and she, you know, she did marry an American husband, she was on vacation in the U.S. when she met him. Mm -hmm. And it's believed that she met him at SeaWorld. Mm-hmm. And then she went back to Malaysia and then they were communicating online, mm -hmm. right? Then she came back to the U.S. to be with him because they had formed a relationship at that point. Um, so she wasn't a mail order bride. Please stop saying that. It's yeah. not true. And I think it's it's a stereotype for Asian women mm -hmm. or women from Russia or the Ukraine to right. be painted with that label. It's a sexist commentary, I mm -hmm. think. And even if somebody does establish a relationship over the Internet or and then they come to the U.S. to be with their partner, I, I just think that the whole term is just so derogatory and it completely replaces the identity that these women bring with them. Right. And I get why people would want to paint her with that brush. You know, Dyson was like five foot four. He was little. He was scrawny. He wasn't particularly attractive. And aside from everything that he said he was, he was actually not any of those things. Right. So I get why you would think, oh, perhaps she put herself in that situation. No, she was charmed by him. Yeah. And it goes back to victim blaming, right? Like, oh, she should have realized. <laughs> you right. know, it's like, no, he's a master manipulator. Right. She is the victim here. This is not her fault. Right. And in, in his book, Mark talks about all the times when Dyson would try to con people, he would get a read on them first. He would always kind of throw a little teaser out to see how they reacted. And based on their reaction, he would either continue or he would walk away. Mm -hmm. And there were several people that said he walked away because I was like, this guy's full of shit. And as soon as they knew that, he's like, I'm not going to deal with these people. But if they gave him any inkling that they might believe him, he went full on. And so Gurley was a victim in the situation. Um, she fell in love. She trusted this person. She believed him. She believed that he was a doctor. She had every. She had no reason to doubt him. You know, according to the Charlie Project website, after they met at SeaWorld, they continued to correspond on, online. And then she came back to the U.S. in 1992, destined to marry him. His name, Dyson Hassenkoft, is not actually his name, but we'll get into that later. Uh, he told Gurley that he was a thoracic surgeon and a geneticist. She found him charming and fascinating, so she packed up, moved to Albuquerque, and lived with Dyson at his home on Moon Street. All right, so... Northeast or what? Oh, probably. Uh, <laughs> Gurley had learned early in the relationship that she was unable to get pregnant, and she desperately wanted to be a mother, according to a former co-worker and friend. Uh, she had been trying to get pregnant for months, and then went to the doctor and found out that she just wasn't able to do that. Mm. So then, out of nowhere... In 1996, her husband showed up after a, quote, work trip uh, with the brand new baby boy. And Dyson claimed that the boy was an orphan from Mexico and that they would be adopting him. Curly was so happy to be a mom that she accepted everything he told her and took the baby in as her own. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Eventually, she started to question things that he claimed and even started to suspect him of cheating on her. That's because... There would be random women calling the home all the time asking to speak with him. And then they were often shocked to hear Gurley answer the phone. But we're going to have to wait until later in the story to get into that. Let's talk about Dyson now. So Dyson Hassenkoft was born Armando Chavez in Houston, Texas in 1965. He was raised in Texas and Arizona, and he eventually went to college in California and with modest grades, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry. He was driven and motivated, and he wanted to apply for medical school, but nobody accepted him. So, 
He did what any budding con artist would do. And after he got over his anger and depression at not getting into medical school, he doctored his transcripts. Oh, naturally. (laughs) And he was accepted into medical school in Utah. (laughs) And this was probably, you know, obviously pre-internet age where... (laughs) It was early internet age, yeah. It it gets, you know, it's was easy to kind of con people yeah you know you couldn't really search engine stuff you there wasn't really a way to to check all these things out it was the days of netscape and CompuServe. Right. it was a simpler time right <laughs> this was before limewire yeah yeah <laughs> it was whenever you would do the, the reactions in chat like you would say dies of embarrassment with like <laughs> asterisks like that, that's where that came from because there was no like graphics to it was all text <laughs> The chats were all text. There were no, no emojis. emojis. Yeah. <laughs> there were no gifts. None of that was there. So he doctored his transcripts. He got accepted into medical school in Utah. And then the school figured out that he had fraudulently applied to the school. And so they rescinded his uh, acceptance. And Mark interviewed a lot of the instructors and like deans and stuff at the school. And they were all like, this guy was a fucking nutcase. <laughs> <laughs> They knew it right away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he then moved to Albuquerque. Lucky us, right? <laughs> um, the land of enchantment. He was enchanted. <laughs> he was. So in spite of being denied admittance to medical school, he told everyone that he met that he was a surgeon and that he held a PhD in genetics, which was all untrue. He was often known to claim that he was 2,000 years old and he had discovered a youth serum that promised immortality to anyone who took it. So then when did he discover this youth serum? 2,000 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say. Um, Dyson claimed to have an amazing education, and this was evident in his seven-page CV. <laughs> <laughs> and when did he get this education 2,000 years ago? <laughs> it had, like, University of Tokyo, oh. Cornell. Like, there were all these schools that he'd never been to. <laughs> He alleged to have attended some of the most prestigious schools, including Stanford University. Um, He claimed to not only be a medical doctor, but also a PhD. And he also believed that he had discovered a cure for cancer. At least that's what he told everyone who would listen to him. (laughs) Uh, Dyson was known to con people out of thousands of dollars. There was a woman in California that he convinced that he knew how to treat her cancer, her breast cancer. So he would give her injections every day. She would receive invoices that were super itemized and detailed with many services. Most of them cost close to $200, and she gladly paid him, I think, $100,000, something like that. In total. Uh-huh, for the hope that her cancer would be cured. But, of course, she died. And nobody knows what he was actually injecting her with. They were vitamin B6 oh. injections. Interesting. So she probably felt good. Right. She was energized. Right. It's just shitty. It's so terrible. The woman's son was... Of course, absolutely enraged by this. I mean, mm-hmm. she she bought this guy's snake oil hook, line, and sinker, and it cost her her life. She probably could have been treated traditionally, and maybe she would have been okay. I mean, yeah. we don't know, but definitely would have been a better chance than B six shots. Yeah, I'm, 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 you know, there's a whole lot of stuff that I feel about, like people falling down the holistic loophole, mm-hmm. or, you know, rabbit hole, I should say. Yeah, when they, you know, they do want to be hopeful that these things are going to work. I get it. Yeah. Especially when you feel like you have no hope. Right. Why not? You know? Yeah. But it just, it angers me that people like that take advantage. Oh, absolutely. Of people in those situations. Like, it just makes me so mad. Do you have any insight onto why he went by this, this name? I know that he was obsessed with Asian culture and he wanted an identity different than what he had because Mm -hmm. he was, he was not known as a good student or as particularly smart or anything. So he had to rely on his charisma and his charm and he didn't like the identity that he was given. So he went through several iterations. Like he has, they found a notebook of him like trying to figure out what his name was going to be. And then the Hassenkopf part, I think was he wanted some kind of other ethnicity to go along with it. So Mm -hmm. he thought German would be a nice one, even though he was like a Mexican American kid from Houston. I don't know what it means or Mm -hmm. what it means to him. I know that he had several iterations of it. I think it's so interesting that, I mean, he's such a con artist that he completely changed not only his life, but his name, you know? Yeah. Well, I think that was probably on purpose. So people couldn't really look into him. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, He legally changed his name too. So that was his name. Another lie that he was known to tell people was that he was dying of leukemia. Mm. 
He claimed that he had to give himself injections daily in order to survive. Vitamin B injections. Correct. <laughs> the thing was, though, every time he claimed that he only had a certain amount of time to live, that time would pass. <laughs> and he would still be alive. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. I mean, it sounds so asinine. Like, <laughs> why? I'm 2,000 years old and I'm going to die soon, but I also found the secret to life. And I can cure cancer, <laughs> but I not my own cancer. My own. <laughs> <laughs> he would also sell his, quote, youth serum Ugh, to anyone. Gross. It sounds so gross. Anytime I think of men in serum, I think this is not going to end well. <laughs> <laughs> to anyone who jazz would, hands <laughs> to anyone willing to pay for it and it was fucking expensive like it was not cheap to sell that again this was also believed to be vitamin b6 so you would feel energized you'd probably feel more youthful and excited uh, but you that was just because of the vitamins it wasn't because of anything else he would tell anyone who entertained his strange notions that he was again 2000 years old and the reason he looked so young was because of the amazing serum that he invented interesting yeah uh, he was constantly looking for new victims to prey on. He used an old internet chat service called ICQ as well as AOL to meet women all over New Mexico and even the world. This led to many encounters with not only potential victims, but also lovers that Dyson would date and lead on. So he was like a Nigerian prince in New totally, Mexico. Totally. Uh, many of them believed that not only were they dating Hassenkopf, but quite a few thought that they were engaged to him. And all of this was happening while he was married to Gurley. Mm. Okay. So one such woman was a Japanese woman who lived in Canada. He met her on a trip to Canada. And during this encounter, she got pregnant. And uh, he convinced her that she would need to relinquish all parental rights to him. So here's some notes from the FBI's interview with that woman. Um, I did get this from Mark Horner's website. So if you want to read more, that's where it's at. Quote, she first met Dyson Hassenkoft in what uh, she recalls to have been the early 1995. At that time, she was working as a sales clerk in a jewelry store located in the Banff Springs Hotel in Alberta, Canada. While she was showing jewelry to an elderly lady, Hassenkopf came in and joined the lady, introducing himself as a doctor from the U.S. He further explained that he had worked at a hospital in San Francisco for approximately 10 years, but now was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and operated a medical practice which consisted of accompanying elderly people on trips so that they would have a physician in attendance if needed. Following that initial meeting, she and Hassenkopf began to correspond with each other. She would address her correspondence to an address in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She would often get cards and letters from throughout the United States and Hawaii, where Hassenkopf was reportedly traveling with his patients. On occasion, she would receive telephone messages from him to call various hotels. When she returned these calls, she would be able to reach him. She emphasized that she never had any indication whatsoever that Hassenkopf was married at the time. He did mention that he had been married on one prior occasion when he was 20 years old. He told her, told her that this woman was also Japanese, and he told her that he was from a wealthy family in Switzerland, but was now a United States citizen. Hmm. She further advised that after a period of exchanging correspondence and telephone calls, she traveled to New Mexico in April 1995 to attend an internationally advertised Indian powwow. On that occasion, she met with Hassenkopf and was even taken to his home in Albuquerque. While she did not tour the entire house, she does not recall seeing any indication that a woman lived at the residence. She only recalls that the house was sparsely furnished. Specifically, she can only recall a chair and a computer and perhaps a television set. She also recalls that there was a large dog outside the house and another large dog in the house. At that time, Hassenkopf told her that the bathroom in the house was being remodeled, and because of that, workers were coming in and out of the home. It would be better if they spent some time at a hotel. She thereafter spent approximately three days at an Albuquerque hotel with him, and it was during that trip that they became romantically involved. She explained in April 1995 she was living with a Canadian boyfriend, but the relationship was not going well. She further advised that Hassenkopf requested that she not retain any of his correspondence to her, and she complied by destroying his letters and cards. <laughs> After her trip to New Mexico, Hassenkopf visited her on at least three occasions in Canada, she believes that these visits were in June 1995, July 1995, and November 1995. And during the November 1995 visit, she became pregnant. She was unaware that she was pregnant until after she had returned to her home in Japan. She explained that she returned to Japan in December 1995 and thereafter gave birth to a son on August 8, 1996 in a hospital in Sakecho, Japan. She advised that she did register the birth with the Japanese authorities, listing herself as the mother and not listing a father. She named the child 
and obtained a Japanese passport for the child under that name almost immediately after the child was born. She explained that Hassenkopf kept in limited contact with her during the pregnancy through occasional letters and very infrequent telephone calls. So she told him she was pregnant? Yep. Did she know that it was his child or did she believe it I was his child? I think she knew it was his, yeah. Okay. During these contacts, he informed her that the child would be inheriting a genetic disorder which affects all members of his family and would require lifelong medical care. He further told her that in view of this genetic problem and in view of his financial ability to care for the child, that it would be best if she brought him the child immediately after birth to be raised by him. Pursuant to his instructions, she flew from Japan through Mexico City to Juarez. This was when the child was 24 or 25 days old. She met with Hassenkopf in the city and they spent three nights together in a hotel. In Juarez? Mm -hmm. And Juarez is just is very close to Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's like Two hours? <laughs> Two hours, yeah. Yeah, maybe an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So they spent three nights in the hotel. She described those three nights as being very traumatic with a lot of crying. She noted that Hassenkopf had repeatedly promised to explain everything to her when she brought him the child, including explanations as to why he had been so secretive during their relationship and as to why he could not marry her. Despite these promises, she learned nothing new during these three days. And at the conclusion of the three days, Hassenkopf took the child and she has never had any contact whatsoever from Hassenkopf since that time. When they parted, Hassenkopf told her that she would not try to contact him. She should not try to contact him since he planned to be leaving New Mexico in the very near future. She repeated that she voluntarily gave the child to Hassenkopf, but noted that she was heavily influenced by his assertion that the child had inherited certain genetic factors, which would place the child in danger if it did not receive proper medical care. Because she had virtually no contact with Hassenkopf since he took the child, she does not know what he named the child or anything about the child's current status. She further explained that because she was so ashamed of her circumstances after she gave her child to Hassenkopf, she decided she could not return to Japan. Instead, she traveled to the southern part of Mexico where she obtained work in Oaxaca. While working in the city, she met and established a relationship with Blank, who is a retired professor. And in early 1998, she became pregnant through that relationship and married him in Mexico in May 1998. Their child was born in August 1998, and in December 1998, she and the child returned to the U.S. Uh, with her husband, initially going somewhere, it's blanked out, where her husband owned property. In approximately February or March 1999, they traveled to Oregon. Her husband also owns property there. She explained that she had previously informed her husband about the affair with Hassenkopf and about the fact that she had given birth to a child previously who was being raised by the child's father. She advised that she continues to miss her son a great deal, but will have to discuss any future parental custody of the child with her husband. She explained that her husband is elderly and he has proved to be an excellent father to their child, but she does not know whether or not it would be fair to burden him with another small child that he did not father. Hmm. What do you think about that? I mean, I think it just goes on to to show this master manipulator that he was. Of course, it sounds like egregious to us, right? Like on the on the surface, yeah. that she would hand over the child, but he had years to cultivate this belief, mm -hmm. right? To uh, and to manipulate her. So I'm not surprised that she, you know, willingly gave him the child. It's not something that happened overnight. It took months, years, um, for him to be able to kind of manipulate her to that level. I think it's easy to to judge these situations, but like we have the gift of hindsight. Mm -hmm. She didn't have that. Right. We can see all the whole picture. She really didn't. She had a small, tiny piece of the picture. She mm -hmm. really didn't know what he was. She didn't know he was married. Right. So. It's so easy to judge her. Yeah. Okay. So he conned this poor woman out of her parental rights. Then he brought the baby home to Gurley and pretended like he had adopted the child. And this case just keeps getting weirder. And weirder. So Dyson was also said to have told any woman that he was romancing that his wife was dead and that she died in a car crash. In the book September Sacrifice, Horner goes into great detail about the many relationships he had while married to Gurley. One woman was a hairstylist at Supercuts. She was impressed by this man and his boastful claims of being a doctor and a geneticist, so they began to see each other. She had no idea he was married. And then one day, a woman comes into her shop... <laughs> And confronts her. She said that Dyson was her husband and the father of her baby. The woman was shocked and decided to break things off with Dyson, which pissed him the fuck off. So he beat the shit out of Gurley that night because he was mad that she 
basically exposed his mm-hmm. affair. That was the night when he was like choking her and the elderly neighbor jumped in to to rescue her. Wow. He only stopped again, like I said, because the neighbor intervened. And then she left shortly after that. This was in 1998 and Dyson was charged with domestic violence. Let's take a quick break. And we're back. So now let's look at Linda Henning. Let's look at her, Linda. <laughs> Linda, I'm looking at you. Um, so she was born October 10th, 1953 in Hollywood, California. She was a model after high school and eventually started a fashion design company and became very successful. In the late 90s, she moved to Albuquerque. She was also successful here, launching a fashion design business. And she even had a fiancé. She had an interest in UFO and conspiracy theories. She was also part of a group that met to discuss issues of aliens as well as government conspiracies. I believe it was once a week. She was a big fan of David Ick. He was a former BBC presenter from the UK. And here are some of the fun things that he believed in. (laughs) Get ready. (laughs) In 1990, David met a psychic who told him he had been born for a higher purpose and that he could speak with the spirit world. So he did what anyone with the Messiah complex would do. He announced the end of the world was coming. <laughs> I feel like this is a like deja vu. Seriously, of the cult episode. Like <laughs> yeah. there's so many. These are the the types of people who start their own cults. Yeah. And he kind of has a cult following. He does. Uh, he's, I would say, the father of the Illuminati conspiracy theory, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Lizard people. Lizard people. Yeah. So he claimed that a catastrophe was coming in the form of earthquakes and tsunamis. He was an outcast on mainstream TV. Because he decided to announce this prediction on a BBC television show. (laughs) The queen was not pleased. (laughs) We are not amused. (laughs) Kill him. No, he he, he, he wasn't killed. (laughs) So he went independent and started creating his own content, including documentary style films and books. Documentary is in quotes. Right. Right. Okay. And it kind of goes back to, like, how these conspiracy theorists can survive, can thrive, and cult leaders thrive, is like, oh, the mainstream doesn't want you to know. I'm being fired by the BBC for telling the truth, (laughs) right? And so, you know, any kind of negative action can just reinforce what they're trying to get people to believe. Right. Absolutely. So... (laughs) He started, of course, so then we're going to go to the other side, the ugly side of this whole world, is he started pushing these anti-Semitic and white supremacy style conspiracy theories in his films and books. So that led publishers to refuse to work with him. And eventually he uh, was forced to self-publish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was I was forced to publish my own anti-Semitism <laughs> works. And it goes back to like his whole belief that um, the people who control the world and the money, they're lizard jewish <laughs> apparently lizards practice judaism right. um <laughs> the illuminati it's all controlled by hollywood jews mm-hmm. and I, I mean these are the seeds like his his nonsense are the seeds of what um even conspiracy theories we hear today are, oh, oh, are. it's like the foundation of all of that that Absolutely. we're seeing now so he claimed that a group of reptilian beings from another dimension infiltrated the uh, earth and its government with a plan to usher in the new world order and they were shapeshifters, right? Correct. They could take on human shape. He believed that these beings worked with the Illuminati to hold the human race hostage. He thought that they, uh, that they needed the blood of humans in order to survive, but that the blood had to contain secretions from the adrenal and pineal glands. So this would mean that a human would have to be terrorized and completely horrified prior to their blood being drank. And this is why uh, the reptilians, as the Illuminati, were working very hard to instill fear in humans through the media and other means. Yeah. Barney, terrifying. (laughs) Teletubbies. (laughs) Horrifying. (laughs) Nightmare inducing. In an article that David wrote for the Scotsman, he claimed that the royal family were blood-sucking reptilians. And here's a beautiful quote from that article. Quote, when you get back into the ancient world, you find this recurring theme of a union between a non-human race and humans, creating a hybrid race. From 1998, I started coming across people who told me they had seen people change into a non-human form. It's an age-old phenomenon known as shape-shifting. 
The basic form is a scaly humanoid with reptilian rather than humanoid eyes. He believed that many in positions of power in the world were part of this hybrid reptilian race. But why am I telling you all this, Lydia? Yeah. I already knew that. It's because it's relevant to the story. If you just give me a freaking minute. Um. Okay. I thought you were talking about David Bowie. <laughs> I'm like, this guy is just describing David Bowie. <laughs> oh, poor Bowie. I know. R.I.P. So, like I was saying before, Linda was super into all this weird shit. And, like, I'm into weird shit, okay? I believe that aliens have a possibility of existing. Yes. We believe in ghosts. We believe in hauntings. Right. But at some point, you have to... <laughs> it's just a <laughs> this whole like lizard people thing is just uh yeah i that's, mean we're laughing now that sounds exactly like a thing a lizard person would say Lydia. <laughs> i know God. I and, some, I, and i have my jewish background so i need somebody <laughs> to sense. make a shirt that says lydia is reptilian <laughs> i am cold-blooded <laughs> cold-hearted snake i'm a cold-hearted snake linda learned that david ick was coming to unm continuing education to give a lecture about all his amazing and fun theories of course linda was planning to attend this was in the summer of 1999 my high school graduation shout out to the class of 99 i think that's why i this story doesn't sound super familiar to me because you were younger yeah i was just i was in like just starting high school when this happened yeah so guess who else was in attendance lydia who? Diaz and Hassenkopf. Oh, of course he is. <laughs> and the two met and quickly became friends. Linda he met Linda. Correct. Linda was fascinated by the doctor and she realized that he was into the same kind of conspiracy theories that she was. Ooh, sexy. So she decided to bring him to her famous UFO meeting that she had with her friends. I'm so curious. What do what did they talk about at this meeting? Once a week, they're meeting and just talking about UFOs, UFOs, conspiracy theories. Okay, that, you said that. Okay, yeah, yeah. all that fun stuff. Um, not everyone was as excited about his attendance as she was. So even they had to draw a line, right? <laughs> because he immediately started telling everyone not only that he was a doctor and geneticist, but that he had leukemia, and everyone was like, mm, mm. "You don't really look like you have leukemia." Right. Um, so a lot of people saw right through this. And they put their uh, discriminating mind towards him as opposed to towards the weird crackpot theories that they were talking about. Sorry, people. Um, <laughs> so Linda even started watching Dimitri, the kid, for Dyson, and eventually they started dating. And so Gurley and, and him had already separated. Okay. And she's still, Gurley's working. Correct. Okay. She's in her secret apartment that nobody knows about. But she doesn't have access to the child anymore? Mm-mm. Okay. He took him away from her. Completely. And, and to she, punish her? Yeah. And she mm. was suing for custody. Oh, got it. Okay. So it's important to note at the same time, Dyson was also engaged to a woman from South Carolina. So Naturally. That's what you do. Okay. So the final person I'm going to cover is a man named Bill Miller. Bill Miller is connected to Linda and Dyson through the UFO group. He was described as anti-government, very interested in conspiracy theories, he seemed to really like Dyson, and the pair quickly became friends. Bill was known, known as an outdoorsman and an avid hunter. That's code for a gun nut. <laughs> he was also rumored to be involved in anti-government militias. Bill, Linda, and Dyson all seemed to believe that New Mexico was the epicenter of some massive problems that were coming for the government, or from the government. Uh, they believed the government was going to launch some sort of takeover of the area, like Okay. What is there to take over? There's nothing here. There's nothing here. And they were all planning to not be around when it happened. <laughs> we won't be in New Mexico. <laughs> but you guys are going to have to deal with it. <laughs> um, Miller had friends in Magdalena. He was familiar with the area. And he was even considering purchasing a property in the mountains near Magdalena. Oh, for $12. Probably. Because it's so cheap. <laughs> It's beautiful there, too. It is, yeah. It's very isolated. Yeah, it's small. Bill also told several of his acquaintances that he had been recruited by Dyson to help hunt and kill Gurley. He mentioned something about her needing to be terrified to ensure that her blood had the special secretions in it. It's so weird. Like, they were convinced that these aliens, lizard people, were hunting humans and, and taking in their energy through their adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. But he also wanted to do that. But he's not a lizard person. He's not a lizard person, but he's an alien from another dimension. Oh. And Linda's an alien queen from the other dimension as Got well. Got it. Okay, okay. And Bill Miller's just like a guy that's helping them. Okay, <laughs> yes, yes. Now, as you would 
for aliens from other dimensions. Yeah, exactly. All of this information about Bill and and the secretions and the blood and the hunting and all that was secondhand and thirdhand information. So take it with a grain of salt. But has anybody interviewed Bill? Probably um, investigators. I think that I think that Mark did. Oh, okay. But read the book if you want to know more. Okay. Okay. We're not going to get to everything that Mark got to in this episode. Okay. Okay. So in the midst of all of this craziness, Gurley's filing for divorce. She also learned that Dyson was trying to secure a private adoption for their son without her consent. So that's when she started pushing further on the divorce path for half the assets and custody of the child and all this stuff. She genuinely mm-hmm. thought the child was in danger, and but she also had no legal parental rights to the child because again he although he fathered the child he brought the child into the u.s under right. suspicious circumstances and said she was already battling her infertility issues um you know it was all i think a way to kind of keep her appeased mm-hmm. and to not kind of push back but of course she grew stronger as time went on right. and so anyone who has any sort of critique of how could she leave the child with him she had no other options right this ch- she had no legal right to this child although she was helping to raise the child and really saw herself as the child's mother she didn't have a a legal foot to stand on yeah because he wasn't technically adopted right so she was not on any paperwork Mm -hmm. that he was adopted right no biological relation and no right um adoption relation right so all of this is what motivated dyson to attempt to harm Gurley. he told a lot of people including some of the women that he was seeing that he planned to kill Gurley. She was on to him. She right. absolutely was on to him. And she was exposing him to right. authorities. Right. That he was this con artist. That right. he was out to con more people. Um, and that he was dangerous. Right. Right. Now we're back to the point in the story where she disappeared. Initially, when police started the investigation, they didn't think that Linda was involved at all. In fact, they interviewed her several times and they treated her like an informant. They had no idea that she had anything to do with this. So they were solely focused on Dyson. When they talked with Linda, she appeared cooperative and helpful. But through this whole investigation, police learned a lot about Gurley's relationship with Dyson. They learned about the domestic violence. They learned about the fact that Gurley had told her coworkers if anything ever happened to her that she should tell the police it was him. They went to her apartment to look for clues and they found a strong overpowering scent of bleach as well as several bleached uh, stains in the carpet. There were signs of an obvious struggle. One detective noticed small blood spots near the couch and on the couch. The carpet was removed from her apartment, as was the sofa and other items, and sent to the crime lab for testing. Same day, a state police officer was driving on Highway 60 just west of Magdalena. He noticed something off the road, so he pulled over. He found bloody clothing, including a blouse, shorts, and panties, as well as a blood-stained tarp. This was very strange, and the timing obviously seemed suspicious to him and if not coincidental, so he sent the items to the state crime lab for analysis. Gurley's purse was found in the middle of a random Albuquerque street. Police and searchers looked for Gurley around Albuquerque. I think it was like a hundred mile radius uh, in the mountains, basically everywhere they could. They also looked in the immediate area surrounding the place where the clothes and other items were found, which included old mine shafts near the Magdalena area. Um, And the shafts were extensively searched. Testing of the clothing and the hairs found at the site near Magdalena showed that the blood stains on the clothes came from Gurley. There was also strands of Gurley's hair, as well as cat hair, and uh, deer hair, rabbit fur, and an unidentified hair, human hair. Gurley did not have a cat, and she did not have a deer. Linda had cats. Right. And I believe Bill Miller had cats, too. And he was a hunter. He was a fisherman. He was a fly fisherman and a hunter, and he used deer hair. To make his fly fishing lures. Mm -hmm. He dyed it pink. Okay. And then the blood that was tested from her apartment was found to be, uh, some of it was Gurley's, some of it was Linda Henning's, and some of it was just an unidentified sample. And I'll explain that in a little bit. There was so much evidence that Gurley had met an unfortunate end, but her body, of course, could not be located. And even though there were exhaustive searches, they really didn't find anything besides the clothing. Another disturbing thing that the police learned in interviewing acquaintances of Dyson was that he was known for telling people that he knew how to dispose of a body using acid and lye. Do what you want with that information. On the night Gurley went missing, neighbors spotted him speeding around the neighborhood and into his driveway. When he got out of his car, they saw that he had painted his skin black and he was wearing camouflage. And they were, of course, suspicious of that, as 
you would be. Right. Uh, there's nothing good that can come out of painting yourself black. Right. Ever. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Um, that same night that girlie disappeared, a woman was making her way across the country to meet her fiance. She was Dyson's fiance from South Carolina. She came to a hotel the same evening and said that Dyson woke her up standing over her bed. Romantic. He said, you shouldn't leave your door unlocked. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said to her? Oh, my God. And she said, I was waiting for you. And he's like, it's dangerous. Luckily, I'm here to protect you. <laughs> the next morning, they were on their way to South Carolina together. Romantic. Where's the baby? Um, He had given it to some couple. No. Yeah. That was the couple he was trying to get to privately adopt him. So he decided to move away the next day after his ex-wife went missing. Oh, there's nothing suspicious about that. It's and, just awkward timing. Right. And then when police went to his house that day, of course, the door was wide open. There was nothing in the house. Come on in. <laughs> just like, oh my God. So police started closing in on the fact that the people involved in this were obviously Dyson, potentially Linda Henning, and probably Bill Miller. They apprehended Dyson just a few weeks after he fled to South Carolina. He was extradited back to New Mexico, and he was charged with Gurley's murder, as well as a host of other charges, including uh, first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree, willful and deliberate, kidnapping, conspiracy to commit kidnapping, tampering with evidence, conspiracy to tamper with evidence, as well as using a phone to terrify, threaten, and intimidate first offense. Those are all the charges. Hmm. There's a bunch of charges of the same, like it's conspir like four counts of conspiracy, three counts of tampering with evidence, that kind of thing. But he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison plus 60 years as part of a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. He was sent to Wyoming at his request to serve out his sentence. Um, and just this year, he asked the court to throw out the case against him and Henning. He claimed that prosecutors colluded with police to cover up the evidence that would have exonerated him. So he... Um he admitted it. He pled He's, guilty. He pled guilty. Um, he goes to prison. Right. For 20 years. For 20 years. He then decides that he didn't do it. Right. And he wants the case thrown out. Correct. And somehow between that time, from what I understand, he also got on the wrong side of some New Mexican gangs while he was... So they sent him to Wyoming. In, yeah. in jail. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he's... <laughs> He's not doing well. No, he's not. Um, I don't think anything's come out of that motion to throw out the case. The his pro, his uh, his lawyer asked for a six month extension to bring evidence to show, and his lawyer's like, "This case potentially has global implications, so it's going to take me at least six months to figure all this out." I saw that. <laughs> that news clip and i'm just like are you again is this like going back to QAnon? like i have a feeling that's where it's gonna go Ugh. i think that they're gonna say that this was like a old government conspiracy a government cover-up yeah. yeah julian assange just somehow involved <laughs> it's just it's just crazy all of it's crazy and he even told an like a cellmate that he had killed girly and he hunted her he had bill miller hunt her like a rabbit. Yeah. I mean, listeners should definitely go and like Google his his testimony oh, on the I'm gonna stand. Play it. I'm gonna oh, play God. It. Yeah. I mean, his this voice that he has, it's so ridiculous and creepy at the same time. He's smiling the entire time. Right. Um, so, in fact, I'm just going to pause here. We're mm -hmm. going to play that clip and then we'll come back. Awesome. I abuse murder as the most heinous crime known to mankind. But when you decide you're going to commit murder, you decide that you're going to trade your life for theirs. I did that. She knew that you were looking for her. And she knew, she knew she was going to be hunted like the dog she was. And yes, she knew like a scared rabbit in an open field. She knew. Okay, so that whole thing just pissed me off. I know. Honestly, like the smug look on his face and mm -hmm. like everything. Ugh. He's just disgusting. He's awful. Yeah. And it's like bizarre Vincent Price voice that he's using. It's so <laughs> stupid. He reminds me of, uh, what was that? Uh, Fantasy Island, the little. Oh, yeah. The little person. The yes. plane. The plane. Yes. He sounds like that. Yeah. 
and I don't know, understand how anybody would have taken him seriously. No. And I know prior to the trial, he had this like long, wispy hair. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if he like groomed when he actually went on the stand. Yeah, it was shorter, right? Yeah. yeah. And then with, with Linda, what's going on with Linda during this? So eventually police learned that Henning had more involvement in the case than she let on, of course. Um, she even claimed that she didn't know Gurley, but prosecutors were able to prove that she had been to Gurley's teller window several times prior to uh, Gurley's disappearance. They had proof that she bought the tarp. So she was probably stalking Gurley, too. Mm-hmm. She bought the tarp. You know, her blood was in the apartment, which we can talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, so she was more involved than she claimed. So prosecutors were able to prove all of that. They were able to prove her purchases that were very suspicious. And it also didn't help her that her DNA was found at the crime scene, as well as where the tarp was found. She was indicted by a grand jury in October 1999, and she was charged with murder in the first degree, conspiracy to commit murder in the first degree, perjury, good, four counts of perjury, criminal solicitation, tampering with evidence, three counts of that, two counts of conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence. Oh, wait, nope. One, two, three three, four, five counts of conspiracy to tamper with evidence. One, two, three, four, five, six counts of tampering with evidence. So did she ever admit to her involvement? No. Uh, The case went to trial in 2002. Her defense team called Dyson to the stand on her behalf. He claimed that he had planned uh, the entire thing and that Miller executed Gurley and that Linda was completely innocent. He also claimed that he had used Linda's blood as a means to distract investigators. Not sure how that makes sense, but he said that he had intended to use another woman's blood because he was known to like just withdraw blood from people that mm-hmm. he was, quote, treating. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the vial broke. So he was forced to use a vial of Henning's blood. And he did that to try to throw the scent off of him, I guess. Like, if there's a bunch of people's blood, then they're not going to know. Right. I don't, I don't understand what he was thinking there. I don't. It, it doesn't make any sense. And it was clearly, I mean, I believe it's a lie. I think right. They obviously all participated in this. Well, and Gurley's blood was there. Like, yeah. they're going to find Gurley's blood. It doesn't matter who else's blood you put there. Right. And so he was saying Linda was not involved. It right. was me. It was this other guy. We hunted her down. Right. Um, Linda had nothing to do with this. But right. clearly Linda saw Gurley as a threat. Correct. For bizarre reasons. Right. That she was, what was it that Linda was a, a, a queen, alien queen? And, and she that, had to kill Gurley to take her rightful place on the throne of alien queens, I guess. And so when they say, when there was no body found, which is horrible in and of itself because there's no conclusion, there's no peace for the family, right? Yeah. One of her cellmates said that Linda told her that she ate Gurley. Uh, yeah, I heard that. I read that too. Well, or that she, like, she mimicked the. The eating the motion. The eating, yeah. the motion. Yeah. And it goes back to this, you know, bizarre belief that they have that you need to feed on the blood and the adrenal mm-hmm. secretions yep. of humans to yep. get their strength. Ugh. Okay, so his testimony, like we talked about, was chilling. He was smiling the entire time. He said that they hunted Gurley down like the dog that she was. Linda was sentenced to 73 years in prison. So she's still in prison. Yep. Do we know where she is? She's in Grants. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. As far as I can tell, she's still in grants. Um, The grand jury indicted Miller for conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping, and conspiracy to commit kidnapping. In addition, they indicted him on several charges of tampering with evidence, including three counts stemming from Miller's attempt to eat some business cards that he had in his sock when he was arrested. I'm sorry. But just like the mental image of him pulling business cards (laughs) out of his sock and eating them. Like, you know, we can see what you're doing. We're not blind, you know. (laughs) It's like, I'm just going to eat this bag of weed. (laughs) So police forced him to spit all the business cards out. They never released whose cards they were. It was probably totally innocuous. Like, I don't know. Maybe he was hungry. You don't know. You don't know his life. Or like in his mind, he thought like these were the pieces to the puzzle, but it was like completely nonsense. Yeah. Like H&R Block tax It's like Lowe's. Right. So, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, um, I think I also read that the clothing items that they found of girlies, you know, it had her blood on it. Yeah. And it also had um, Hazenkov's, um saliva on it. Yeah, his so, DNA. So they were, so again, it supports the possibility that there was some sort of like cannibalistic, something where he was biting her. Right, right. That's true. So here are the charges that were finally brought against Miller. Two counts of tampering with evidence and three counts of attempting to tamper with evidence for the three business cards that he was trying to eat. In his trial, he was sentenced to 
one year of probation. That is so crazy to me. And he never did he um, s- try to help investigators or anything like that. He was not cooperative. He uh, actually sued the state and their handling of the investigation. And that case made it all the way to the New Mexico Supreme Court. And they overturned some of the some of the tampering with evidence or some. They overturned a lot of the other things that he was you know, convicted of <sighs> or accused of. So in 2010, Henning appealed her convictions, claiming that investigators mishandled the case. Uh, The only charges that were overturned out of that were the charges of perjury. Everything else was upheld. So she remains in prison to this day. There's so much that's just like really fucked up about this case that I couldn't even get into like the witness testimonies and Mm -hmm. all the other things that people had said um, because we just don't have enough time to cover it in one episode. But the thing that bothers me the most about this case, I'm going to circle all the way back now, is that Gurley did everything Right. right. She did everything that she could have done to protect herself. She even moved. She didn't tell anybody where she lived. Like I said, she reported to the FBI, the police, everything, fi- filed an order of protection. And in the, in the end, none of that was enough to protect her from him. I couldn't find any information to indicate that Dyson was anywhere other than Wyoming. And I believe that Henning is still in grants at the women's prison. But that's... It's very frustrating. Like, she had enough evidence to prove that he was abusive, that he was a danger to her. I mean, those... That... That um, strangulation incident alone, mm-hmm. you would assume, would be enough to to jail him. Yeah. Or, you know, awaiting trial or whatever. So it's just, it's very frustrating. And research shows that any sort of crimes involving strangulation are a high indication that um, somebody is going to be capable of murder Correct. and on homicide. So it's just, it's so frustrating. It seems like, and I, this isn't about bashing law enforcement, um, you know, but it just seems like they're was more that she was telling police that they could have potentially acted on. Well, I think we see that in a lot of cases. We saw that in my mom's case, Mm -hmm. you know, where police just completely ignore Mm -hmm. and don't charge the husband with what... I mean, she had eyewitnesses. She had people that intervened on her behalf to Mm -hmm. protect her that could have testified against him in court that he actually did this. So I don't understand why he wasn't arrested. I mean, he was arrested and charged, but why wasn't he in jail? Right. Yeah. And at that time, they could have also put the pieces together that he was a con artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could have at least gotten him on fraud, Mm -hmm. right? There's that woman that died in California. Right. There's the woman that he convinced to give her her baby to him. Mm -hmm. There's so many cases of of him being fraudulent. Like, that would have been enough to send him in prison for at least, like, 20, 30 years, probably. I know. I know. It's it's so frustrating. I mean, I really feel like this is something that... (laughs) just didn't have to happen and it's even that much more infuriating that he still gets the last word Mm -hmm. because he will not tell people where her remains are um he's like holding this card she also linda won't won't say what they did with the body just Mm -hmm. that they dismembered her which they were able to piece together because they found like the sword in linda's home i forgot to cover that um and obviously even though there wasn't a body they were able to piece together that there was this murder that sword was purchased on the day that Gurley disappeared. Right. From World of Knives. It's just, it's so sad. And, you know, one thing, um, you know, their obsession with, like, these beliefs about aliens and, right. and all that the stuff. The sensationalism of the case. Yeah. It's just, I can't help but wonder what they did with her body. It's just so sad. It is sad. Um, and I hope I did her story justice today. I... You know, I wanted to tell it as it, as it is, as a domestic violence case. Yeah, we have to talk about the craziness. And yeah, it's kind of funny. But the fact that she died at the hands of her husband is not funny. And domestic violence is never funny. So I hope that my listeners don't feel like we were making light of the situation because um, Gurley didn't deserve what happened to her. She was well-loved, well-liked, and we're laughing at Dyson and these crazy people because they deserve to be laughed at. Um, but Gurley does not. And so, you know, if people were offended by that, I'm sorry, but uh, some of this stuff is just insane. It's completely insane. And that's why it's so frustrating that so many people um, allowed them to behave this way. Mm-hmm. So that's it. That's the messed up case of the disappearance of Gurley Chu Hassenkoft. Her body has yet to have been found. But I am glad that the monsters, a couple of the monsters responsible for her death, uh, are are in jail where they can't hurt anybody else. But it's just a sad, sad story. Yeah. So, all right. Anything else you want to say, Lydia? No. 
Uh, anything you want to say to Chris Evans before we go? Hi, Chris. <laughs> I know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for going through this journey with us. Um, again, if you are in a situation where you're experiencing domestic violence, please reach out for help. There are resources available. And stay safe, New Mexico. Thanks for listening to True Consequences. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram at True Consequences Pod and on Twitter at True Cons Pod. True Consequences is listener supported. If you'd like to support this one man show, please go to patreon.com slash true consequences. Thanks for listening and stay safe, New Mexico.